Now, I've, I, I previously showed you the, the classical divisions of th uh, theology as taught in most seminaries uh, in America. There is a segment of theology that's missing here. There is a segment of theology that is not separated or taught in seminaries. That particular segment of theology constitutes five-sixths of the Bible and yet is omitted as a specific focus of study. And that's the study of Israelology. Israel as an uh, instrument of God in its plan of redemption. And uh, uh, Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum got his PhD by highlighting that and demonstrating that, and his book is on Israelology is a classic in the field. And uh, the great tragedy of many Christians is they have no grasp of the Old Testament, in terms of its foundation for the new, and they have no grasp of Israel's role in the future, not just the past. And so that's one of the things we want to be sensitive to. One of the byproducts of millennialism is confusion between the role of Israel and the church. I encourage you, as you study your Bible, is to be sensitive to the possibilities, at least, that Israel and the church are distinctly different they have different origins, they actually have different missions, and they certainly have different destinies. And uh, I think being sensitive to that will clear up a lot of confusion. This idea that Israel has been replaced by the church is what's sometimes called replacement theology. Many, many prominent, publicly uh, uh, high-profile people are actu actually come from a replacement theology point of view. As a result, they do not regard Israel as having any special place in God's future. The problem with that viewpoint is that it makes God a liar, because as you read the Old Testament and the New, God repeatedly hammers away on this issue. In fact, Paul spends three chapters in his definitive statement of Christian gospel called the Book of Romans hammering away on this very theme. Now, the other aspect of this issue of replacement theology is it lays the basis for anti-Semitism. You can actually write a very competent essay from Augustine to Auschwitz that the amillennialism led to the Holocaust in Germany. If you want to lay the blame for the Holocaust at someone's feet, don't overlook laying it to the feet of the pastors who were silent and did not discourage, in fact encouraged. Um, the, uh, the, some of the abuses that led to the uh, Holocaust in, in Germany. Why is this important? Because it's going to happen again. It's going to happen again. Um, when we study the 70 weeks in Daniel, I want to remind you that the 70 weeks were specifically addressed to Israel, not the church. And that's a very important distinction that many scholars overlook. If you study Paul's epistles, you'll notice that this period during which that Paul divides the work people into three categories, Jews, Gentiles, and the church. And he makes that point several times in his epistles. And it will not always be so, and I'll come back to that when we get further in the Revelation. Because you're going to discover that from chapter 4 on in the book of Revelation, these distinctives between Jews and Gentiles reappear on the horizon. During the church, Paul emphasizes the unity of the body of Christ. But from chapter 4 on, you're going to discover there's an astonishing uh, distinction made between uh, Jews and non-Jews in, in the book from chapter 4 through 19. And we'll deal with that when we get there. Now the other topic that comes up in eschatology is this whole concept that's called the rapture. You hear people talk about the rapture. And the skeptics will say the word rapture does not appear in the Bible. Yes, it does in the Latin Bible, in the Vulgate. It comes from... The word in the Greek text is a harpazo, which is a word meaning to be snatched up forcibly. The great snatch is one way you could call it. When the Greek was translated into Latin, the word is rapturo, and the word rapture is a derivative from... is an English adaptation of the Latin Vulgate. But the word does occur, but if you want to split hairs, the word is harpazo in the Greek. This is unquestionably the most preposterous belief in Christianity. The idea that at some time, at the snap of the finger, so to speak, all the true believers in Christ 
are going to be snatched out of the world bodily, immediately, suddenly. That sounds absolutely zany. That sounds crazy. There's only one thing that this theory has going for it. It happens to be what the Bible teaches. And uh, I'm reminded of Richard Feynman at Caltech, and he talks about particle physics. He says that particle physics, as you get into it, is the most ridiculous theory that ever came, has ever come along in the field of physics. The only thing that has got going for it is that it's unquestionably correct. <laughs> and, and that's sort of exactly what you come out with, with this strange view. We need, I think, it's, I think it's appropriate for us to understand how weird this must sound to someone that doesn't have the background in the Scripture. And it's also astonishing to many how clear it is taught in the Scripture. And I'm one of those extremists that even see it taught three different places in the Old Testament, let alone the New, but we won't get to that here. We talked before, we went through this, the, uh, the uh, Christian epistles, we noticed that they were in a pattern, doctrine, reproof, and correction, doctrine, reproof, and correction. We left out and left for this review the second, first and second Thessalonian epistles, because they're doctrinal. And uh, see, Romans was doctrinal but in soteriology. Ephesians was doctrinal but focusing on ecclesiology, the church. And Thessalonians is doctrinal fo focusing on eschatology. And I left it to this hour because I wanted to focus on eschatology because this is where so many of the questions come up, so many, especially new people of the Bible, get confused with all the funny words and what, what on earth is that all about. So that's why we're about it today. The Thessalonian epistles are probably the two earliest of Paul's epistles, dated typically by some scholars in the very early, uh, uh, you know, 52, 53 uh, A.D. time period. First, and they both uh, written from Corinth to Thessalonica. The first epistle of Thessalonians deals with our blessed hope. Both these epistles are so important to us, the short little epistles, but they both happen to deal with the key topics of eschatology. The first epistle of the Thessalonians is, speaks of our blessed hope. Now you need to understand why this letter, it's always when you read these epistles it's worthwhile trying to understand why Paul was writing the letter. And the background of the first epistle to the Thessalonians was, he was up there, he planted a church, they were all excited, they, and he taught them uh, about the second coming of Christ and so forth. And after he's gone for a while, he finds that they're all upset because some of them among them have died. And they're confused because they are, apparently they may have felt that the you know, that Christ's coming was coming so soon, it never occurred to them, some of them, some of their believing Congregation is passing away. So Paul is dealing with that issue. In his letter, he first talks about looking back, he talks about their exemplary conversion and how exemplary evangelism they are and how you know, they're really a turned on church. But now looking ahead, he's giving them information about comfort. And he ex what's interesting about this letter, he's reminding them of things that he, they had already been taught. And it's interesting to realize he'd only been there a few weeks. And this church, it was planted by Paul, he'd been there a few weeks, he leaves now for a year or so, he's writing a letter back reminding them of things he taught them when he was among them. So he taught them these issues during the first few weeks of their Christian experience. And so we're going to take a look at that. In, um, where he hits their dilemma head on is in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians. He says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. And he goes on to explain. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. This is an event that collectively is called the first resurrection. What he's dealing with here is that the day will come when the dead in Christ will receive new bodies. And we are not, we who might be alive at that time are not going to interfere with that. 
It says, that The Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. They're going to get their bodies first. Then we, which are alive and remain, in other words, we haven't died yet. This is all going on, presumably, why there's some of us alive. Um, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Strange thing to try to sketch on a, on a, on a, on a drawing board or something, try to visualize this. There have been all kinds of attempts in Christian movies and stuff to render this, and it's, no matter how you do it, it sounds pretty weird. But there is a, what he's saying, there is a generation that's not going to die. But the ones that have died, that are in Christ, will receive new bodies, and we're going to ca we will too, and we'll be caught up with them in the clouds. This is the, and this is all going to happen, we're going to find out, in the twinkling of an eye. And uh, not in the flink, blink of an eye, twink of an eye, less than 10 to the minus 35 centimeters, uh, uh, seconds. But anyway, um, this, is, this is the uh, harpazo, one of several passages on this topic. And uh, we are, shall be caught up together. The word caught up in the Greek is harpazo. In the Latin Vulgate under Jerome's translation, it was rapturo, but here it's, and then it translated into, uh, into, into uh, English, it'd be caught up or snatched up. But the term in the Greek is very precise. It's to be forcibly caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so, from that point on, by the way, so shall we ever be with the Lord. From that point on, we'll not be separated. And uh, there's lots of confusion because when a Christian dies, his uh, soul and spirit is with the Lord. His body decays in the grave. What kind of body does he have in the meantime? We don't know. Some people guess maybe we have a temporary body. We know he doesn't get his resurrection body until this event. So what happens between? There's all kinds of scholastic conjectures. Most of what we know about the subject comes out of Luke 16, and there's this, we've done some special briefings on that, but let's just move on here. This whole event that Paul is talking about in 1 Thessalonians, and he also alludes to it in 1 Corinthians 15, is a fulfillment of the promise Jesus gave them when they were in the upper room. That night he was betrayed. Before he gets to Gethsemane, they have the famous discourse uh, in John 14 through 17. And he opens that. He says, Let not your heart be troubled, in John 14. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. For in, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Now, that's pretty exciting. He left them to prepare a place for us, and he's been at it for 1,900 years. We know what God did in six days. What could he do in 1,900 years? I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to really make a parallel there, but I think it's interesting. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. There's that commitment again. Not only will it come to get us, we'll be with him from that point on. This is a little confusing. Because we think of the second coming when he comes with his armies to crush the Antichrist and all those things. How can he come with us if he says here he's coming to receive us? This is the first hint, if we're paying attention, that there's two comings involved. Most people don't realize that he's coming back twice. Once for the church and once for Israel. Different events. We'll, we'll come to that. But okay. Another thing, as we get back to 1 Thessalonians, when we get to chapter 5, there's some interesting commitments that, that are often overlooked that God gives the church through Paul. Paul continues in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. And I'm going to suggest to you when you read the whole passage, he's re implicitly re referring here to the children of the night. Just trust me for a minute, we'll come back to this. So for yourselves, you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night to those guys, is what he's in effect going to be saying here. For when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of the light and children of the day. Ye are not of the night or of darkness. Let us... Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by the Lord Jesus. 